Hi, and welcome to another Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. On today's show, I meet an artist who is based in New York. Uh, they actually started out in Minneapolis, then they moved to a bunch of different places and ended up in New York. They run a gallery uh, where they not only do their own work, but also showcase the works of others and actually set up gallery shows uh, with other artists in this old building in Brooklyn, I believe they said it was. So we talk about how this all happened, how they find artists, how they put on these works, and uh, just how they connect with people. So it's a fun conversation, and here it is starting right now. I'm Sparrow Lewis, and I'm an artist of all types, but um, predominantly working on oil painting right now is my main thing. But I'm a sculptor at heart. So You're a sculptor. I didn't see that on any of the stuff that you had, really. Yeah, I mean, that's that's my passion is sculpture, but I, I kind of approach painting from a, a, a sculptor's kind of sensibility, I would say. Okay. I sort of sculpt my paintings, um, if you will, and, uh, and I've just opened a gallery, and um, I'm... A culture sculptor is really what I've been coined over the years. Okay. And it kind of, sculpture that's actually sculpture. kind of rhythmic, culture sculpture. That's, it, yeah, cu- culture I like sculpture. that. Yep. Okay. And so you're located where? In Brooklyn. I'm in, in Brooklyn, New York. Um, if, you, if you know Brooklyn, Bed-Stuy, Bushwick, Brownsville, um, right kind of in Broadway Junction, right in the heart of where all of those three neighborhoods meet, but technically Bed-Stuy. Okay. And all right. So now I want to go back to the sculpture Bedford thing. So you, you started out as uh, as someone that did sculpture. Like how, how were you making sculpture? When did you start doing that? Well, I mean, I would say that was my passion. I never really got to go into sculpture the way that I'd like to. So that's probably the next uh, phase for me. But, um, you know, in, in ninth grade, uh, Mr. Cantor's ceramics class kind of thing, you know, Okay. Uh, and clay, um, but it was the '90s, and clay wasn't very cool <laughs> for whatever reason. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I guess I wasn't aware of this yeah, I, <laughs> of this I, shunning of clay. It's a, you know, I, I mean, it's that big division between craft and art. You know, it was considered- okay. I, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah. And- um, also it was considered very feminine. I know, uh, depending on, you know, how you used it, the way that I was using it. So whatever, I was something that I, I was passionate about. I, um, did a lot of silver working. I've done some glass blowing, um, you know, and really, just, I, I, I loved sculpture so much. And then when it came to two dimensional work, I was just like, eh, you know, it, it really didn't, I felt like it couldn't translate. I just, it was very resistant to two dimensional work. Um, Part, partly because I think I started with acrylics and acrylics are very flat. So it took me moving into oil paint to really go, oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I can really sculpt my, and I do, I start with a really abstract intuitive piece and then I just kind of slowly but surely move it, move it, move it, move it into whatever um, form it ends up in. So so did you switch to painting because of this uh, sort of, I guess, opinion that you saw in sculpture when you were no, doing I mean, it? I- I, I, I went to an arts high school. I, w- I was always really passionate about art. I was, you know, um, had just a knack for it, you know, just natural drafts, drafts person and, and things like that. But, you know, I was on my own really young and I ended up um, like really moved cool. out. Yeah, I was on my own with my own rent, everything at what 16. I had my name on my first lease at 16. So I was working huh. multiple jobs and throwing parties to pay the rent and different I've done things. That. I ended up being getting into sculpt, uh, culture sculpting, as I said, more than um, actual art. I kept planning to go to arts, art school, you know, and um, at first I was going to go to Savannah College of Art and Design in, in Atlanta because I wanted to get out of the cold weather. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, And just different things, life happened and I had certain, you know, family tragedies and different things. And I ended up um, being in and around music so much that I just kept getting pulled into the music business. So I really, my, my former life was as a booking um, agent, uh, talent buyer, event coordinator, underground party thrower, you know. um, Where were you, where were you doing this at? Um, Los Angeles, uh, New Orleans, uh, New York. Yeah. Oh, fun. Yeah, so okay, those four cities: Minneapolis, New Orleans, uh, L.A., and New York. Wow! So All right, I threw hundreds of events, you know, over over, you know, and I, I just did. We just did this huge art crawl, which is kind of cool because 
you know, I really started to art really late in life. So I've regretted that quite a bit. Like, oh man, I should have started earlier, you know, because it takes so long to mm-hmm. really, you know, master your craft. And, um, but, you know, kind of ending up merging the two where I'm doing events and doing uh, and helping uh, create a community and helping to sculpt culture in its in itself. I can draw upon all those years of doing events and music and, and, and coordinating and organizing um, and even even like activism organizing, like grassroots organizing, because um, culture for me comes from the bottom up, just like grassroots organizing is all kind of the same thing. Um, so it's been it's that that sort of has reconciled itself in the last year in the fact that I'm like really moving into doing both. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I'd really like to just be in my studio painting and and, and, right. and doing whatever. But, you know, life has uh, many facets and I feel called to actually participate more in the world and not just hide out. <laughs> yeah. As much as I wanted to, I, I actually kind of enjoyed the pandemic because I, I, you know, it was kind of perfect for me because I was like, ah, no obligations. I don't have to do <laughs> well, were you setting up online events at all during the pandemic? No, I really, I'm sort of really analog and I, um, I'm very, I don't know. I'm very, um, I, I actually resisted the online thing. I probably zoomed less than anybody, you know, Okay. <laughs> um, you know, of course we had to a little bit, but, um, yeah, no, I just really just kind of, I got off of Instagram, um, instead of getting on it, you know, so the temptation to, to, to live through the world digitally, um, I started to go for it. Like I, the first thing I did in the pandemic was get off of Twitter. You know what I mean? Like okay. not that I ever was a big Twitter user, but it just kind of really turned me off. And I actually just went to my studio and worked, um, you know, there and, you know, I homeschooled my son and, you know, my husband worked from home. So it was actually, we were very, very, very lucky. <laughs> so, okay. Now, so, as far as your work though, what would you, so we talked about the, okay, the moving from acrylic to oils and everything, but your work itself that you do, how would you explain the work that you do? Um, I call it spheralism because it's just, uh, it's multiple reasons why I would uh, use that term. Um, my philosophies about everything really kind of, uh, come down to the sphere and, um, everything being, being, you know, part of a whole. I really like to think of the universe as a holographic universe or multiverse. And um, a sphere sort of, for me, contains, uh, it's like the the ultimate geometry to contain a whole. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, it's sort of philosophical, sort of metaphysical. Um, and then just uh, on, as far as an art movement, um, I'm very inspired by cubism. You can probably see that in yeah. my work. Cubism is obviously dealing with three-dimensional um, reality on a two-dimensional plane, um, and it, but it's very masculine, right? So it's, spheralism is sort of a feminist answer, a yin to the yang of cubism, I'm, you might say, because um, so I'm dealing with the multiple planes of reality, not just the three-dimensional reality, but also, you know, I mean, I guess cubism is also dealing with time too. So, um, but you can see the futurist movement. I'm also inspired by that. So motion and time and I, you know, now we're much more, um, you know, I guess literate on quantum mechanics and reality. So, um, I think that's something that people are really interested in looking at ways to express what's happening in reality um, from multiple dimensions all at the same time. Right. So okay. that's uh, so it's, you know, I, I, there's a quote, um, what is it? Uh, Viewing the world, not as a, a succession, but an assemblage of worlds in rotation. I think that was um, hmm. Octavio Paz, I think is, uh, is who said that, but I, I love that idea of, you know, multiple spheres kind of all happening at the same time and you can see that in my work also just it's very feminist in the curvilinear uh um just kind of the joys of the swoops the, you know the joys of the you know <laughs> loop to loops and swirls it's kind of a dance it's very it's very much of a, a, a dance that i do when i approach the canvas and so yeah um so you know i guess that's that's kind of uh one way i would look at it um all right 
When, when would never, you say it started going in this direction? Because, I mean, you probably didn't start out that way, but it probably kind of evolved that way. Were there influences or things that happened or things that you were just kind of leaning towards? Like, how did that come about? Um, well, I mean, it really came about like a sculpture. So um, basically, like I said, I was, uh, I, I, I had... I was artistically inclined. I got into an arts high school. You know, I was voted most likely to succeed as a fine artist type of thing. I had all of these kind of plans. Life kind of took me out. I ended up being more in the music industry, culture sculpting on, you know, really a lot more social. I always planned to do art and I always wanted to go to art school and it just never, it just never happened. But, you know, so I, I basically had to teach myself to paint and to, you know, um, and, and so I'm taking from, I'm just drawing from all of my life experience as well as all of the influences. And I never do things from the outside in. So I, one of the things that I, I love to do is dance. So my, my one of my former joys, I had an um, improvisational dance troupe called Raw Sugar that we just, really the whole thing was like, um, yeah, you had to, you had to, it was a, a, a review of uh, women. It was a, again, showcasing women, but it was kind of a, antithesis to well, it wasn't an antithesis it was an answer to what could possibly be outside of say uh the burlesque trend that was happening in the early 2000s okay so i really liked the burlesque trend in the way that it was um you know showcasing again spheres like uh, somebody uh, one woman comes out and you get a, just a moment in her world but it's all kind of based on this sort of typical, you know, male gaze, power play, blah, 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 you know, like very coy, whatever. And I always, I just thought, well, what if we did almost like a dance karaoke where you just, you get a song and you go up and it's very much also like freestyle. Okay. So, um, so the, we had to freestyle. So you get your one and a half, two minutes and you just had to freestyle. And so it was the burlesque format, but but each woman would go, go up and just freestyle, and that they couldn't they couldn't be choreographed. It had to be just raw. All right, that was really fun and successful. But um, that's actually how I approach the canvas too. I just go to a blank canvas. I never know what I'm going to do. I just go completely intuitive, and it starts out very abstract. So it might be. I mean, and sometimes I'll just leave it in an abstract state um, if I like it, you know. But but generally, I'll just kind of slowly, 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 things will emerge um, as I'm looking at it, almost like a reading tea leaves or something. Okay. Or like the cloud, you know, if you're gazing at the, you know how things emerge from that. So I just kind of see what emerges and just kind of start to accentuate um, certain things as they come through. And then, then it, so I, I really try to get out of my own way as much as possible and have no opinion about what I'm doing and not make any judgments about good or bad or right or wrong or pretty or ugly, none of it. I just try to get as much out as possible. And then I'll kind of have a sense that I've gotten the subconscious out onto the canvas. Um, and I know that that phase is sort of over and then I can, I can sit back with it, look at it, edit it. So it's just a process. I really do feel like it's a sculpture because it's like chipping away, adding, subtracting adding and subtracting i never go in with like a, a drafted drawing or something so you to, don't you don't start a project with any specific thought or uh outcome in mind really no, okay no. um there are a few there are a few exceptions to that um where you know you know if somebody asks me like my husband had me do an album cover so you know i took took the concept of the album or i listened to the music while i was doing it so um and sometimes I'll see I'll see something that I'm on. So one of one of one of, uh, one of my best friends, DJ Soul Sister in New Orleans, she was doing the Boiler Room um, as a, as a program. They they have people come in and, and broadcast their uh, set. Mm -hmm. And so I was listening to that while I was painting. So I could see that that was definitely influencing it. So I went ahead and, and went with it probably pretty early on. I knew ended up sort of like a dance floor scene. Um, and and then there's one or two where I've had something that I specifically want to process, you know. Um, so there's one big one. People love this painting. It's it's to me it's so painful that I like hide it away. It's one of the few pieces that I kind of deal with uh, maybe darker subject matter. Okay. Um, I call it Mother Effer. <laughs> um, and so I went to that canvas specifically to kind of process and heal, um, you know just 
experiences that I've had, but also just on the world uh, level, it's uh, dealing with how we are uh, defiling the earth, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and environmentally just kind of explo- the exploitation and, and um, it, it, it's dealing with how that is a reflection of how violence against women is a reflection on violence against the earth. So that's obviously not a very fun subject matter. So I went, I didn't know that that was exactly what it was going to be, but I knew that I wanted to process kind of the ugly stuff that I saw happening in the world. So, um, so there, there are exceptions to that for, but for the most part, I just go and whatever comes through, comes through. I'll get a sense within a couple of days probably, but sometimes I won't know what something's about until months later. I'll look at it and go, Oh, that's what that is. You know? Okay. So it, it's a long process. Yeah. I was going to say you, so you're saying it takes months at a time for you to finish a piece or like, and how many pieces do you have going at the same time while you're working on these? That's another spherilist thing. Definitely all my, I work on my entire body of work at the same time. So I might have huh. 30 pieces that I'm working on, you know, um, I'll probably focus on three or four of them, but um, I'm really working on all of the all work at one time. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that is also going back to music. I mean, that's how, people work on albums you don't just go all right we're gonna write one song and when we finish this we'll work on the next song for the album no you have a bunch of stuff you're working on you try out many different things go back and forth yeah absolutely yeah a good analogy that's very true now you did mention that you had done uh album artwork and i see that you've done a few uh album cover artwork pieces now Uh one are all of these painted or are some of them like uh, graphic design, like generated, like, like or, or are they all painted pieces? Because I saw one you had, you had a fishbone one, you uh-huh. had, uh, some of them might even just be dedications. One is a P-Funk one, which I think you may have just been doing uh, for fun, or at least that's what I saw on your website. And uh, yeah, I grew up with P-Funk. They were like, I'm an old school funketeer. So yeah. Um, they were like my big brothers, like my family. Um, so I, I'm not sure which one you're referring to. I think there's something that I, I've done like some flyers for P Funk. Yes, I think and it might have been a flyer actually. Now sister. that I think of it, yeah, it was like George's birthday party. This is way back in the '90s. Um, and you I also did, have a painting of him, right? I did a painting of George. Uh, it was his birthday a couple of years ago. I think that was during the pandemic, so it was his birthday. And that's that was one where I, of course, I looked at a photograph of a. Right, you can't just sculpt of, that one and go. Maybe it'll look like him. No. <laughs> done in about six hours i like that piece because those ones so i'll either do one or the other i'll do something really quick and just let it go and whatever's there and then leave it alone and it feels finished to me so that one felt done um really after i think it was two sessions with it but it it was very quick because it was his birthday so i was like oh let me just do it on his birthday and um and then I and then I got attached to it because <laughs> so, <laughs> so people wanted the painting and I'm like no I love it it's it's uh, kind of overlooking the whole studio and it just kind of gives me permission to you know I I would say that the funk ethos really um, does encapsulate how I approach art um, yeah so to me he's the maestro of it all and I also me. I also like that it's um, it's kind of one color toned. Um, for the yeah, most it, part, it, yeah. Van Dyke Brown, that's it. Yeah. yeah. It was also me just trying that method. I think I, I had seen some video about it and uh, I was like, oh, let me try that. So it was also just oh. me trying it out for the first time. Okay. And, so, and then I also saw there's an artist in, I want to say the Netherlands, that you did uh-huh. uh, uh, an album for on Bandcamp. Oh, that's my husband. So Oh, that was, is. Okay. Yeah. The Netherlands, the u tracks put it out, but that's my husband, Davis Beck. And so, yeah, I did. That. Okay. I didn't know that connection. All right. Well, well that, that makes sense. Good. And I'm going to, I was going to be like, how did the person contact you? But clearly that he turned to you and yeah. said, Hey, he, make me an album. <laughs> yeah. Yep. No. Um, nope. We live together. So he, he, he commissioned that piece <laughs> for the album. So that again, I, I listened to the album. I wasn't sure what I would do though. He didn't have any instructions like paint my face or anything. Um, but I think, my experience in music and, and record companies and whatever, I kind of knew that they'd want his face. <laughs> so, right. Um, so yeah. I, you know, I, I, I had a, I, an inkling and it compositionally, it's so funny. Even my 10 uh, year old is like, mom, that composition is off because I purposely, it's a four by six piece. And so I did some area on there cause I knew that they were, the graphic designer was going to slice it up and use different parts. So I did some area that's just kind of blank, not blank, but it's very, 
it, it's it's not as crowded so it's just that compositionally it's like i'm looking at it right now and it's like uh it still bugs me to this day because it, i wouldn't have done it for an actual painting uh shauna hall from funkadelic is a good friend of mine so i think i've done a uh, album cover for her um purple crush is one that i think was just digital so i think okay um that's a that i don't even know if that's on my site or anything but that's um uh, i think I think that uh, was, but, but I still did it with a pen in Photoshop. <laughs> it's okay. I'm not with, slighting you for doing it digitally. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 but I'm thinking about it. Like, yeah. So, um, and you know, of course I did hundreds of flyers and things, you know, so I'm not a graphic designer by any means. And, um, but I, I made it happen because you do when you're doing events you Yeah, know, to just do that myself. Okay. Now, when you said that you, uh, during the pandemic and you got off of social media for the most part and try not to use it. So with connecting to all these people and meeting these people and creating events, how do you promote yourself and your work? Well, that's a good question. So, I mean, I really, you know, created scenes from the ground up, like in Minneapolis, like some of the things I did back in the eighties are still going on, you know, things that I started in LA is still going on. I got DJ soul sister started in new Orleans. She's still the top DJ in new Orleans, you know, different things. And we did all of that without social media. Mind you, um, there was a period of time, you know, I was big on, you know, MySpace back in the day and mm -hmm. early, um, early Facebook. I got off of Facebook in 2012 um, and uh, never went back. And Instagram, I just use it sparingly. Um, I just think that um, if social media was totally organic and the algorithms were just uh, based on human interaction and it was not socially engineered at all, I would probably use it more. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just, uh, it. I, I can, because I was on the ground in culture, sculpting culture in real time and seeing how um, the seeds of culture germinate and how they, how they move in naturally organically with people it i can't help but see the social engineering behind uh social media mm -hmm. so it just turns me off and i'm kind of here to prove like hey you don't need to do that so one of my most successful things i do right now is um an art salon and it's social media free and people love it and and, and in the middle of brooklyn in a really tucked away area you have to be in the know you gotta you gotta be you know back in the day we would be in a scene you know like people would you know um, I'm trying to think, I don't know Madison that well, but you know, I know Madison has like a scene, like there's like, you know, or back in the day did, but mm -hmm. Minneapolis certainly did. I'm trying to think of, um, you know, I don't know if you, if you spent much time, I guess, I guess that's what, like four or five hours away from Minneapolis. Madison. Four. Yeah. So I don't know I, uh, if you spent much time, but back in the eighties, it was uptown scene and the first Avenue scene. So, um, you know, you'd have to, you'd have, you'd have to be there. That was the thing. Like mm -hmm. you, would hear about it and things became legendary and people were you know you you were either there or you weren't you know but okay. um, i think that that's i mean it's it's not I, by no means is that ever going to be the dominant way that we move i mean i think we're going to be digital so for me it's just why not show the kids how to do this and they love it the kids you know they all are like how did you do it before? yeah so how do you spread the word about these then with if, if they're uh created it, I guess you you said before analog, so. Uh, it well, I mean, how do we ever do it? You know, um, my friend Shauna Hall that I just mentioned, she used to be friends with Craig. Mm -hmm. and Craig was just a guy in San Francisco who knew what good parties to go to and things to do, and he literally would write it down and go to Kinko's and Xerox it and hand it out. Okay. That became Craigslist. Oh, so okay. it's like flyers and stuff. Okay. Well, well I'm just saying that became Craigslist. Like, we, oh, that's okay. What we did. We, you know, he, he was in the scene. And yes, there was something on paper. So yes, I, I still do um, regular flyers. Um, zines are great. That was one way we, did, you know, yeah. uh, asked around culture. Luckily for me, I'm in New York. So, you know, New York actually still has, you know, human beings walking around. And that's the thing is um, what's interesting. Um, and, and I don't know what, what, what age range you're in, but what's interesting is back in the day before all of this, there was there was a different kind of algorithm. There would be all these kind of chance meetings that maybe not, you know what I mean? We would, we would just, the people you were supposed to meet and, and be with or do things with you would. And I don't know how, you know, Yeah. Um, George Clinton says you naturally gravitate toward that, which you love the most. And I, you would just see that in real time. Um, 
and you just kind of, you know, would just sail with it. And so, I, I mean, I guess, you know, having a little bit of both is cool. You know, I'm not opposed to digital. It's just, I'm just, you know, yeah. the, the, the joke between my husband and me is he's electro man because he's all about all the tech guru geek dumb that uh, in the world and i'm vintage girl because i just i like the old school analog you know right um, i'm so. both <laughs> <laughs> it's good to be both you yeah. know yeah C constant struggle with myself no it's not like that at all but now with the artists that you work with in the community and meeting people and networking how do you uh go about uh doing networking i mean for be, some advice for people like how do you make connections with others how do you meet others and connect and then also you've set up the uh you set up different gallery shows and events and things so how do you meet the artists that you work with on these that's a good question um so again lucky for me i'm in new york so that's one of those things where i mean you can meet people on the train you can meet them at there's always events summertime is like the absolute best in new york there's free events music concerts parties in the park and you know in brooklyn it's a very west indian a culture so everybody's out on the street partying so you i mean if you're a person that engages with other people you just naturally meet people and you start talking and people connect and you connect on a guess what human level like fancy that person to person you know yeah. what i mean that actually is really how the most of what i do um comes around um but i i, I am in an art studio building so it's it's an old linoleum warehouse that, yeah it's a cool looking place it's so i love it it's my heaven on earth um so one of the things how i ended up starting the gallery is that um the owners of they have three buildings in brooklyn and queens um in ridgewood which is basically it's like right on the border of bushwick um so it's almost like brooklyn it doesn't seem like queens <laughs> not to this queens but <laughs> i have no idea what, what the difference between either is <laughs> um, boroughs have their borough pride okay so, all right Brooklyn, you take I your word for it <laughs> um so uh so because i was doing my um art salons and they the, the the owners of the buildings have three buildings they they're from most of the owners are from italy or spain um and they just thought oh we're going to you know, buy these buildings, we're going to um, outfit them as art studios and music studios. And naturally, this amazing, thriving art and music community will just happen because that might happen in Italy or Spain, but mm -hmm. it's not happening here. People have their, you know, headphones on, they're like this, they just go to their studio, they're very isolated. And that's not me. I'm very, I'm like, hey, what are you doing? Well, you know, I'm just somebody that wants to talk and connect and, you know, do that. So, um, over time, I've been there five years, um, which is really, you know, I basically that that room of one's own allowed me to learn to paint. So that's really most of my work has happened in the last five years of having that art studio and being able to have a place to go to make it. Okay. So I connected with people organically in the building, um, you know, again, just talking and um, and also, you know, because I've done this for so many years, a lot of it is that I know a lot of people from all over the years. Right. You know? Yeah. So, uh, I don't think, you know, I'm 50. So it's like, I don't think your average 50 year old is going to go to, you know, out if, the, if you've never been social before, you're not going to, you know, go out and be able to go boom, boom, boom. It's just that that's been a part of my life for, you know, you know 35 years. So, so you're not a club kid is what you're saying. I am. A, I, I, I was, I was a club kid. <laughs> right. <Absolutely. laughs> well, we all were at one point in time. I mean, you had the story about, you know, having parties to pay rent. So of course right, we were all exactly. that at some time. I was, but I was, yeah, it's so funny because my daughter just did a ball, you know, like the voguing culture. Um, so Purple Crush, it's interesting. Isla, she's, uh, she's got a, um, got a, she's the mother of the House of Ebony and they, they do these balls or whatever. So she, yesterday, I think it was yesterday or the day before, the theme was club kid. So she called me like, mom, how do I, you know, dress up like a club kid? You know, yeah. <laughs> tell me about the club kid days. Um, but anyway, so yeah, the, the, the club kid thing was, a, was I was definitely part of that because I love to dance and I love, I love the club scene. Okay. But um, so, so to go back to your question, how, how does it happen? It happens by me being a talkative person that likes to connect with other people. I think it's an energetic thing, you know, uh, you just either resonate with people or you don't. Um, and uh, that's what I like about New York. Like, I don't have to translate myself. I don't really translate that well in 
LA, for instance, uh, people think I'm just too much. <laughs> okay. It's like, whoa, dude, slow down. And um, <laughs> I'm like, in New York, people get me. We, you know, we're like, All right. I don't, they know exactly who I am. They don't have to, I don't have to explain myself. Um, so that being said, you know, I think that New Yorkers are pretty well equipped to just connect on a human level. We can, you know, just read each other. And it's just one of those things like you, they used to say game, recognize game or yeah. real, recognize real, whatever. That's that kind of thing. So, um, that just accumulates over time. And then, you know, pretty soon if you do some, um, really interesting, um, authentically, uh, connected events, people are starved for that. So they just like, I have them coming knocking on my door. Like when's the next salon? When's the next event? I need some more of that. Well, how often do you put on events, uh, throughout the year? Uh, well, so the salons were monthly. Um, and then now that we're doing the, um, gallery, so the gallery came about because I, I'll finish that story. Um, okay. going, tying that around is that, the owners saw me doing the salon and they were like, well, wait a second. We've been trying to create community. Nothing's happening. Can you do something here? Like, cause we see you doing the salon and it's amazing. So how are you doing? Basically same thing. How are you doing that when you're not promoting it anywhere? And, um, it, what, what's, ne- and I said, well, what, what would be great would be an exhibition space. Cause it's great to get together and we share our art and we talk about our art and we have an open mic and people get to um, share whatever they're up to creatively. Um, but it'd be great to be able to share that with the world, right? So it's great to have your sphere, you know, the salon is a sphere, but then, you know, we want to like keep expanding that sphere bigger and bigger. So um, uh, I see a lot of the studios are unrented, you know, why don't I use those studios um, for exhibitions? Um, Handy. When, yeah. And and, and uh, Rebecca uh, um, Brockella is the name of the management company. She saw the vision and we just threw this enormous art crawl that was like you know probably a thousand people came through that day and um, nice. it was yeah it was and i and i <laughs> i clearly you know there's that, that that kind of good luck that you get when you're completely green and you have no idea i curated like eight rooms out of the blue you know like it was a lot okay <laughs> it was a lot had i had i known <laughs> yeah. i was truly insane to do that much but also it's one of those things where um and, and so, you know, so that has answered the, the need of Raquel management or, and, and that's, that's just them as a group of artists and musicians that want to see this happen. They don't have any, there's no real business reason they want to create community other than that was their intention when they first um, outfitted these three buildings in, into art studios. So it's great to see that come to fruition. Um, but uh, so wait, I lost my train of thought. It was, um, I was talking about the, what was the last? The I, I last? was asking how many of them that you put on a year? Oh, how, how often? Okay, so there you go. Um, so because of that, we're going to be doing um, monthly um, art shows um, with Level Gallery. Um, and then other community events for the residents of the Raquela buildings, as well as the larger art community in Brooklyn and Queens. So uh, we'll do workshops and um, artist talks, uh, screenings, um, you know, movie screenings that are relevant. And, That's nice. Uh, so probably three, four times a month we'll be doing things uh, wow. from now on. Yeah. But it'll be a, a monthly exhibitions. Summertime um, is a little bit slow. We're going to slow down a little bit. So we'll probably just do one or two things over the summer. We have July 22nd through 29th will be our next show. Um, so okay. and- we're, we're just kind of... Just like I do it with the canvases, I don't know what's going to show up. I just follow the lead. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> I show up. I just know what I'm supposed to do and I just do it. So, and it usually works out. <laughs> okay. And then one last thing, the, uh, the projects that you're working on, is there any project that uh, you're currently working on or uh, something that you're going to be putting out there that you uh, would want to tell people about or just, you know, upcoming projects like that? Uh, well, just uh, Level Gallery as a whole, the Level Arts Collective, which is all about what we've just been talking about with the salons and the greater collective. What I really want to do is merge the worlds of uh, music and um, art in a in a way where it's high caliber music and high caliber art. It's not, uh, you know, your I, I, and it's being, you know, doing it in a certain type of way that I haven't really seen done quite a lot. Um, and on that note, um, one of the things we're doing in July is exploring how uh, 
you can make sound from paintings. So my husband is a professor at Berkeley School of Music, um, uh, the master's program in Manhattan. Um, and they do a synthes synthesis where they're creating sound from the actual geometric sound wave, right? So, oh, okay. um, so I thought, well, hey, you know, my, my paintings are very, uh, <laughs> I see tons of sine waves in my paintings. Why can't we... Um, you know, maybe tr take some of that and translate it into um, sound. So uh, some of the things that we're working on, we're just very early in those stages, but we're going to explore that in our um, July uh, programming. We'll be um, hmm. taking visuals and turning them into sound. So there's a, a, a artist named Duncan Figurosi that is working on that. And so he's got uh, a painting that he's done that, slowly like loops on like a um feed and a camera that reads the painting and turns that reads oh. it and he uses ableton which is a program that my husband teaches ableton live and uh actually has that translate to visuals and um uh images of all kinds and uh, it kind of collages it so it's 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 in real time translating it, it just shows up differently each time it does it so he has it yeah program to do it in sort of a random way so that it's constantly doing something new but that's something that i'd really like to explore more of um and that's something that you know i think is pretty exciting that yeah we no that's pretty cool kind of collectively working on okay well nice and uh so i want to thank you so much for talking with me today i'm glad that we got the chance to meet each other yeah thank you for having me <laughs>